Hi there, this is Elise Benin, your marketing mentor. And this is the podcast for you if and only if you are ready to leave the feast or famine syndrome behind, and I mean for good. I hope you know by now that one of the three essential marketing tools for creative professionals, and of course included in my simplest marketing plan, is networking. And you really can never learn enough about networking, including me. So today's episode is especially about the sound of the right networking attitude. Because as I was talking with networking expert and public speaker, Julie Brown, all I could think was, If only more people had her networking attitude, they would do it so much better. So this is your opportunity to absorb Julie's voice and through it, her enthusiasm and excitement, and especially her detachment about networking into your own brain. You don't have to be like her, but you can certainly think like her if the way you think isn't really getting you where you want to go. So listen and learn. Hello, Julie. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, well, hi. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Excellent. Please introduce yourself. Well, I am Julie Brown, and I am a networking expert and coach and professional speaker. I'm an an author. I wrote a networking book, and I also, like yourself, am a podcast host. So I also have a podcast all on networking and business development. Awesome. And what does it mean to be a networking expert? Uh, well, the definition of expert is you have to do something for 10,000 hours. Okay. So I think that, that's the actual definition. It's mm-hmm. like after you do something for 10,000 hours, you can call yourself an expert. For me as a networking expert, you know, I had spent 17 years doing business development in large corporations. So business development, I was doing all through networking and relationship building and information gathering. And that was it, you know, that was in process. I was becoming an expert doing it for, for those 17 years. And then when I went out on my own seven years ago as a consultant and as a speaker was when I started calling myself an expert. I had been doing it for 17 years and now I had all of the tools to tell, to help people become networking experts in their own right, or not even become a networking expert, but actually just getting comfortable with it and using networking as a way to change their careers. Mm. You know, a lot of people, the reason I'm focusing on the word expert is because a lot of people really struggle with the idea of being an expert or becoming an expert or feeling like an expert. And so Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you think about the word expert. And seven years ago, when you went out on your own, did you feel like an expert and therefore called yourself one? Or did you not so much feel like it, but called yourself that anyway? How did you deal with that? No, I don't think I felt like an expert. Um, I started really, you know, I took the 17 years of experience that I had and then I continued to learn and I read a lot about networking and I did studies on networking and I read other people's studies and I continued to evolve as an expert. So I don't think calling yourself an expert means you're done learning. I think experts always are continually learning and that's why they're so good at what they do. So I'll never stop studying relationships or studying rooms of people or studying how people connect. I think when you are an expert, it doesn't mean you're done learning. It, your learning just gets deeper and more broad. I love that. Right. So listeners, anyone who is learning and loves learning can call yourself an expert. Well, I think technically you have, I mean, I think if we're going to go back to the technical term of 10,000 hours, I do, I, you know, I do this with my clients a lot. I'm like, have you been working on your career for Mm -hmm. 10 years or whatever? And they're like, yeah, I'm like, okay, you're an expert in this career. Walk into whatever room or meeting or event with the confidence that you are an expert. Right. Confidence. That's a big issue also. Maybe we'll come back to that. But I want to focus on networking because it really gets a bad rap. And I wonder if you know why. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons why it gets a bad rap. I 
I would start with the idea that some people probably have this antiquated idea of what networking is. And it's you go into a room with you know, a bunch of people you don't know, and you're not very strategic about the room and you're supposed to talk and, you know, have small talk and learn what people, you know, ask, what do you do and give as many many business cards as you can and gather as many business cards as you can. And then all of a sudden not supposed to build business. I mean, and that is why it gets such a bad rap because it's not, networking is not about I love networking events, but networking is so much more than going to events and trying to meet people. It is the entire process of understanding who you should be connected with, how you can be a good connection to somebody, how you can really be be friends and build relationships with people, how you can be a good part of another person's network, how you can help each other, how, how you can be invested in other people's success and therefore they're invested in your success. I think we look at networking from a very, very antiquated you know, way of doing it, which was, you know, back then that's what you would do. You would go into rooms and you would just talk and you would have meaningless conversations Mm -hmm. just so you could trade business cards and hopefully follow up. So you've kind of implied a definition of what it is in everything you've said so far, but do you have a formal definition if someone asks you, what is networking anyway, Julie? No, you know, I don't ever create like, this is the cut and dry definition of networking. For me, Networking for me is continually meeting new people so I can foster relationships all all the while maintaining and strengthening the relationships I already have. Mm -hmm. That seems doable. And you've used the word connection several times already Mm -hmm. so far in this conversation. So what is connection and how does that relate to networking? So there's a a famous quote that people do business with and refer business to people they know, like, and trust. And so how do we get to know, like, and trust? It's understanding your connections. It's understanding what you have in common that makes you like each other. It's understanding what you do differently, that you can respect each other for your differences. It's really understanding. It's connecting on so many different levels. So for me, the old way of doing networking was you would connect purely on what you do for a living, which when you think about it, as us as 360 degree individuals, is such a small sliver of our existence. When we are such, you know, much more diverse and and colorful human beings, like why wouldn't we connect? Why wouldn't we increase the surface area with which we could connect with people? So I use that word connection in a lot of different ways. It's, can we increase the surface area with which we connect with people where we're not just talking about work, where we're getting to know them as a human. Can we make connect as many connections as possible so that we have a wide, deep, broad network that serves us and that we are we can serve them as well? I think the word connection is really powerful because there's there's a lot of different parts of it as as far as networking goes. And do you connect with everyone you meet? No, no. I mean, it would be impossible. Um, It would be impossible to have a relationship with every single person that I meet, but I do a really, really good job of staying in touch with my network. So, and, and I know we'll talk about marketing, but my marketing does a, a lot of my connecting for me because my marketing is so personal and and so it reaches so many people that when I connect with somebody for the first time and maybe we're not going to ever see each other again because I'm on a stage and they're in the audience, but they come up to me afterwards. If they get on my newsletter or if they follow me on LinkedIn or connect with me on LinkedIn or listen to my podcast, that is a way of me constantly being a part of their life. They're hearing my voice. They're seeing my likeness if it's on my videos. They're learning about things that happen to me every week if they're on my newsletter. My marketing does a lot of my social connecting for me. So it sounds like your way of thinking about connecting means that you can be connecting with people without actually knowing it about each specific connection or each specific person. Because I think people get really caught up in, well, how am I going to stay connected to all these people if I meet them? But if you've got this broader marketing 
process and plan and other tools, content marketing mm-hmm. tools, it sounds like you're using a lot also to stay in touch and stay connected to people, then that is doing a lot of the keeping in touch. Yeah. And I want to just make a point that when we look at our network, every person in our network is at a different stage of a relationship with us. The strength of that relationship is different for every single person in your network. It would be impossible. It would be impossible to have every single person you know be your best friend, be your you know, what I call in my top five, as far as networking goes, be a part of your top five, the people that you talk to multiple times a week that you're always, um, you know, asking questions of, and, you know, tossing out information to, or asking strategic introductions from, it would be impossible for all the people that you know, to be at the same strength of relationships, which is why it's so wonderful that our networks can be broad and we can have really, really, really close relationships, and then we can have acquaintances, and then we can have distant connections, and then we can even have dormant connections that come and go throughout our career. Um, It it doesn't, I think people get caught up because like you said, they're like, how am I going to maintain all these relationships? Those relationships are at different strengths and are maintained at different times in different ways. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned that you love networking events. What do you Mm -hmm, love about networking events? Don't you find them awkward sometimes or some of those conversations awkward? Well, yes, they can be. uh, But I love networking events because I know that if I go to a networking event, I'm going to meet somebody I've never met before. And I have this line, and I think you've seen me speak, that I have this line that I use a lot that the people you meet will change your life. And networking is how you meet those people. And I cannot tell you how many times I've walked into a room full of strangers and met somebody who has changed my life in a way that I was unexpected, whether they introduced me to someone who became my best friend, or they introduced me to someone who became a really, really important part of my network, or they hired me to come and talk to their company. I look at every networking as, event as a as a way for me to meet somebody who can change my life or my career. Yeah, actually. So now you're making me think of the people I've met at networking events who have indeed changed my life. And I remember one of the very first networking events I went to in, I think it was 1988 in New York. It was a kind of a women in business event that I was dragged to. I didn't even know what networking was at the time. <laughs> but I had decided I was going to be a professional organizer. And so I went to this event and someone said, someone asked me what I do. And so I said, I'm a professional organizer, which I of course thought I had made up, but she said, Oh, you should know about the national association of professional organizers. Yeah. And so I actually got involved in on the ground floor of the New York chapter that was just starting. And the people I met through that organization changed my life. And so if that Mm -hmm. person hadn't mentioned that organization in that moment, who knows where I would be today? I love that. I love that story because it also goes to show that you can be the person that changes somebody else's life with something that you say, Mm -hmm. and you might not even notice, you might not Mm -hmm. even recognize that that piece of advice you gave is going to be a pivotal piece of advice that that person's going to carry through their career. Mm -hmm. And actually, that makes me think of something else I've been thinking about lately, which is how my experience of anything is different from your experience of that exact same thing. So for example, right, this podcast, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. It's already awesome. But, you know, maybe I'm having a bad day and I just walked through a pile of glass while I was walking my dog and she was pooping at the same time. And that kind of put me in a bad mood. And I was just like, like, get me home. And I bring that to our conversation. And maybe when I hang up, I'll be like, all right, that wasn't my best effort, but Mm -hmm. you might think that was awesome. And how in a networking event also, when you feel like, oh my God, this is really awkward, or I can't think of anything to say, that may not be the experience of the other person either. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? 
Yeah, I we nobody judges you as much as you judge yourself, <laughs> you know, and nobody's thinking as hard about you as you are thinking mm-hmm. about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing I've learned. I've, 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 I mean, even like on a totally different note, when I I email a lot of people and I'm waiting for responses, and when I don't hear back, I've always have to tell myself it's not about me. They have a life on the other side of that email <laughs> that I have no idea what's going on. Right. But you brought up a good point of sometimes people are think this, this is really awkward. Like I, I don't know what to talk about. And I, I love telling people that they are allowed to talk about life at networking events. Cause we think we're only supposed to talk about business. Oh, what do you do? Oh, tell me more about that. When, when I've already mentioned that we, I wouldn't want to increase the surface area with which we get to know people so we can get to know, like, and trust faster. And so I created this thing called the list yourself approach, which is literally just making a list of all the things that make you, you, but you're not allowed to put what you do for a living on it. Mm. And not that you can't talk about what you do for a living, but I don't want it to be the only thing that you talk about. So I want you to go into networking events, prepared to talk about life, prepared to talk about that you have a dog and, and I have a dog and we can connect over Mm -hmm. that. And what other, all the other things that we have in common, or maybe the things that we don't have in common that I can learn from you. And when we have these more human centric conversations, it endears us to the people more. And I have a lot of people that I coach that say, oh, I, but I never know how to follow up after I meet somebody at a networking event. And I always say to them, if you had had a human centric conversation with them, the follow up just happens on its own because you write an email the next day and you said, I'm so, so excited that we met. I'm so excited about this conversation we had when I got home. I looked this up and I thought this article might be interesting to you. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. Like, I can't wait to learn more about you to see if there's possibilities for collaboration in the future because you are the exact kind of person I like to work with. Like that's easy Mm follow-up. That doesn't happen unless you get to know that person a little bit more than just beyond what do you do. Mm -hmm. And this conversation is happening because you followed up with me after Mm -hmm. we met in Nashville at How Design Live. Right. Exactly. So what is your, how do you make sure that you get to your follow-up? How do you, what is, do you have like a formula or a process that you teach or that you implement for yourself? Well, I do, I don't have a set formula or a system where I'm like, this is Julie Brown's system for Mm follow-up, but I do have, whenever I'm traveling to conferences in which I know I'm going to be meeting a number of people at one time, I make sure that the day after the conference, I clear my calendar Mm. the day after the conference, at least in the morning so that I can send thoughtful follow-up right after that conference. Mm -hmm. Um, and I make sure that I, I, I lot of, there's a debate now like, Oh, our business cards a thing. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah. I keep business cards and I ask people for business cards. Cause that is a part of my structured follow-up where I ask people for a business card and I put it, I have this little, it's weird. I've never smoked, but I have a cigarette holder and it, <laughs> and I reason why I have a cigarette holder is cause it's big and I can fit a lot of stuff in it. Mm-hmm. It's bigger than just like a business card holder. So I put everything in that gold case. And then, then the day after the conference, I open that case up and I go through and I, and another thing I should mention is when I meet somebody and they give me their business card, I make a note on the back, like, this is where we met. This is what we talked about. So that when I get back, I have that easily remembered conversation. If they don't have a business card and so say they have a QR code for their LinkedIn. So we'll connect on LinkedIn at the conference, but I will have a, you know, LinkedIn's great because it has a, it a chronological order of the people that you've connected with. So I just go into my messages in LinkedIn and message everybody that I connected with at that conference with, a, again, a personal note about what we talked about. So excited to stay connected on LinkedIn and learn more about them and follow their career and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So those are the, my two major ways that I follow up right after an event. Now, of building and maintaining relationships is just following up and doing it right after, you know, an event is great. But then you have to think about, okay, what is my continued follow-up? So I just make sure that I, you know, I keep a database of the people that I meet 
And LinkedIn makes it easier for us if they are active on LinkedIn to see what they're doing and comment. But if they're not, then you have to actually go into your database and say, okay, it's been three months since I met them at this conference. I'm going to send them a message and see how they're doing. So that you, you do have to, that you do have to make sure that that is on top of mind and that you have the initiative to do that because there's a, you know, action and intention are two different things. (laughs) Okay. So that's making me think about confidence again, then, because I think in the moment or the day after you meet someone, you still have that excitement and the, the freshness of the experience of meeting them. But mm-hmm. maybe three months later, that has receded a little bit. And now you're like, well, why would they want to hear from me? They didn't even respond to that first follow-up I sent. And, mm-hmm. and then the confidence kind of depletes a little bit. So how do you think about confidence and where does it fit into this whole follow-up process? Yeah. So again, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier that if some, if I email somebody and they don't email me back, I don't think that they didn't like me or they didn't want to connect with me. I think they probably had something going on. Mm-hmm. Um, the average worker gets 135 emails a day. It's really easy for your email to have gotten lost, or maybe they flagged it for follow up and their life blew up, which happens all of the time. Mm-hmm. And so I reach back out, not with any feeling of like, oh, they didn't want to connect with me, or is there something wrong with me, or like my confidence doesn't take a hit at all. Mm-hmm. I res- I reach back out and say, hey, you know, we met at that event a couple weeks, you know, a couple months ago. I sent an email, but gosh, did you know an average person gets 135 <laughs> emails a day? It would be really easy for you to not see it. And then also because my book has a swear in it, my my Mm. email gets caught in spam a lot. So I'll even make a joke about it. I'm like, you know, sometimes my email gets, you know, straight to spam because of, because of my trucker mouth, you know? (laughs) And so I, I just make it as, as happy as I am as a person. Like I make it sound Mm. like me. Um, you might meet some people who, I don't know why, but they wouldn't reach back out to you. And this is the thing about networking. You just go meet more people. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know? My dad always said that about, you know, making money, right? Oh, the prices went up. Just go make more money. Go make more money. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that. That was a good thing. That was an important lesson. Oh, you lost your client? All right. Go get more clients. Go get another client. All right. Yeah. Which kind of leads us to your marketing. So let's wrap up a little bit with the uh, kind of broader uh, plan that you have for your marketing in addition to networking? What else do you do? So networking is a big part of my networking. I, I'm sorry, a part of my marketing plan or my business development plan. Most of my work does come in from referrals or somebody, you know, somebody saw me speak and then, the, you know, they're in the audience and they, their company hires me. But I'm, I'm trying to make sure I d- don't make this sound like this is cumbersome because I love my marketing efforts and I have a lot of fun with them, but I do a lot as far as my marketing goes. So every week I have a newsletter comes out every Wednesday mm-hmm. and that newsletter is super fun. And it's just about something that's happening in my life right now and how it relates to relationship building or connection or confidence or networking or whatnot. So for example, my my newsletter last week was about how my husband and I bought a record player, like a old, like a record <laughs> player. And we've been having all of this fun going to record stores and buying records. And the thing about listening to music on a record player is like, it, you're in for the long haul. There's no Alexa next you know, <laughs> on a record. You, you, so you pick an artist and you listen to their entire portfolio, which is something we don't do really anymore. And I equated it to relationships. Like, there are A sides and there are B sides and there, your relationships will go through these things where it's really easy and you can just follow along. But then there are some times where you're like, oh, wow, this song sucks. You know, <laughs> you get into a little bit of a funk. And like, so it's weird. Like, I always feel like I can make everything into a network. <laughs> so the newsletter, and I love writing them. And so, and they always have wonderful graphics. I have a wonderful, um, marketing manager and graphic designer. You know, my podcast comes out every Wednesday But then I also create on LinkedIn a lot of posts, um, which are snippets of my speeches. So I'll take an hour speech and cut it into like 30 to 45 second 
you know, little pieces, or I do my own real videos that I love tip t- networking tips. And those come out twice a week. And they're all branded with my colors and I do swear in them because that is <laughs> my brand. Right your brand. Mm-hmm. And people absolutely love them. And it is a tremendous amount of work. I don't want your listeners to think that it's not a tremendous amount of work. It is. But for me, just having that constant brand, like if you, if somebody says, do you know Julie Brown or have, you should hire Julie Brown. When they see my brand, they're like, okay, that's what I'm getting. Mm-hmm. Because everything is consistent and I'm in a position where I only want to work with the people who want my energy and the way I deliver information. So when somebody comes to my brand, they're either going to be like, absolutely not. We cannot hire somebody who swears on stage. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to be like, yes, this is exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you do some prospecting as well, right? I do. So I spend a lot of, um, I get hired by a lot of corporations that have internal employee resource groups. So specifically, I get hired by a lot of companies to speak to their women's employee resource groups and or their young professionals. And so when I noticed that this was happening, that I was like call after call after call were these internal employee resource groups, I was like, okay, well, I need to make a business development plan to go after employee resource groups across the country. And so there's a tremendous amount of research that goes into that. So you have to think about, okay, what are the biggest companies? What are their ERGs? Who runs their ERGs? How would I reach out? Do I have any connections that can make a strategic introduction for me? And so I've been doing this and the results have been really wonderful um, because I was always waiting for the work to come to me, which was great. And it does do that. But now I'm going out and prospecting and it's even so much more fun for me because when I'm in a meeting, they're like, oh my God, I'm so glad you called. Like we totally need this. Mm -hmm. And so getting out of my own way, thinking, oh, if they want me, they'll come to me versus I have something that people need and I'm going to go out there and tell them they need it. And they do. And they tell me, yes, we need it. (laughs) That's awesome. All right. Well, I think you've shared so much of really valuable kind of down to earth information, which is what people need. I always like to give a baby step at the Mm. end. So picking anything we've talked about, what baby step would you suggest a listener can take to move more in the direction of, let's talk about networking specifically. So one thing we didn't talk about is a really, really strategic way or um, quick way to grow your network is to ask the people you already know to make a strategic introduction for you. Mm -hmm. And there's this thing in social network theory called triadic closure, which basically is if you are introduced to somebody you don't know by a mutual connection, by a mutual friend, the rate at which your relationship grows is faster Mm -hmm. because you share a mutual friend. And so think about maybe, maybe there's three people in your network right now that you could say to them, Hey, I'm actually trying to strategically grow my network. Who in your network would be a good connection for me, but I would also be a good connection for them? Mm -hmm. Would you mind making that introduction for me? That's the easiest way to start growing your network. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Well, Julie Brown, tell (laughs) the people where they can find you online because I'm sure you're not the only Julie Brown out there. No, it's a pretty popular name. So my, if you want my website, my website is Julie Brown B D. So B as in boy, D as in dog, but for me, it stands for business development. Mm -hmm. So Julie Brown BD.com. I am Julie Brown BD on LinkedIn. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I would love that. But uh, please, when you reach out and connect, just let me know where you found me. So then I can make that triadic closure between the three of us, um, that you found me here. And I'm on Instagram at Julie Brown underscore BD. Beautiful. All right, Julie, thank you so much. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. Do you see what I mean about her attitude? It, It could be contagious if you let it be. And here's the baby step Julie suggests. Pick three people in your network who you can ask for a strategic introduction. Who could be a good connection for you? Because this is one of the easiest things to do. Reach out to someone you already know and ask for a connection. So if you want to build a thriving business on your own terms, the first step is to sign up for my quick tips at marketing-mentortips.com. Once you're on the site, you'll find lots more resources, including my simplest marketing plan. So enjoy, and I'll see you next time.